Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We are going to go ahead and get started as people are joining and we'll get uh, going on our conversation. So my name is Teresa Sweetland. I am the executive director of Forecast Public Art. We're the organization that is hosting this conversation today. So, so happy to have so many of you interested in this topic and here today. Um, before we jump into our panel, I'm going to say a few words about Forecast and also about the publication forward uh, that is hosting this conversation. You can go ahead, Mallory. So Forecast Public Art is a nonprofit organization. We are based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, our mission is to activate, inspire, and advocate for public art that advances justice, health, and human dignity. We just celebrated this year our 45th year. We were founded by artists for artists who wanted to work in public and public sphere and for um, over four decades have been committed to doing that work and um, remaining artist focused. So uh, next slide, please. So where we work, our team works um, with communities all over the country. Um, we have a kind of special relationship with our home region here in the Midwest, and we love working in uh, small communities and rural communities throughout the Midwest. But as we've continued to advance this work uh, with artists and communities, we've started to work more uh, in the five last five years, especially across the country. Um, and that includes... Um, many communities from Appalachia to Oahu uh, and many places in between. Next slide, please. So here's our team. We are um, practitioners, we're artists, we're planners, designers, educators, really a multi-talented um, uh, team that comes from multidisciplinary and cross-sector practice that supports artists in their um, public art professional careers and, and dreams and also works with public and private partners across the country. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk about kind of the five areas of our work. Core to our work is our creative studio, and this is really where we both support individual artists and we support opportunities for artists. So often people come to us looking for an artist, they don't know how to do that. Um, so we help connect them to the right kinds of artists and opportunities. And we really put an emphasis, especially in the last five years, um, on BIPOC artists and supporting artists who um, have not had those kind of opportunities in the field. Next slide, please. We also work in planning and engagement. So this is a lot of our public sector work. We work in partnership with cities, counties, and states, um, also transportation agencies, housing agencies, to help support both public art planning, arts and cultural planning, but also um, artists' roles in engagement. So leading community engagement, listening ses sessions, and other work that helps support more equitable places uh, and around the country. Next slide, please. Um, we also have found that in this field, uh, this intersection of um, arts and culture, community development, um, and planning, that there is not a lot of opportunities to learn how to do this work. So we've developed a learning institute that offers training uh, directly for artists and also other decision makers and leaders who are looking to integrate uh, arts and culture and work in partnership with artists in this space. Next slide, please. And then we found that as we go forward in this work, that there is change that needs to happen, right? We need to see more equitable policies, practices. And so we've developed a change lab that allows us to kind of poke at and disrupt those systems and practices to make them more equitable. So we fund fellowships. We've funded a racial justice and public art fellowship and indigenous visibility fellowship. Um, and we'll actually be announcing uh, next week a climate fellow for an, an artist or somebody working in this space to help bring more equitable uh, practices into the field. And then finally, um, our Forward. Forward is our publication, and that's really kind of the host of these series and also um, the case studies and stories that we put out into the field really to provoke new thinking, to inspire new ways of working. And um, this is our sixth issue on climate. It will be coming out next Tuesday. So all of you will get it after this conversation. Um, but Forward is um, really started during the pandemic, actually, when we were trying to, when the uh, opportunities for artists really collapsed. 
um, and we wanted to see how we could continue to show and inspire people to see artists as creative problem solvers and partners and leaders across sectors. So our first issue is actually on public health. Um, we've had issues on transportation, housing, um, community safety, design and sustainable um, communities in Indian country. And then we have climate. And we also have a monuments and memorials issue coming up in 2024. So I'm going to say a few words about this issue on climate. So you can go to the next slide, Mallory. So we're really excited. We've been working for over a year on this issue. Um, we This is really focused on why public artists are critical partners in climate resi resilience. The issue... Um, covers four main topics, um, heat, pollution, population displacement, and flooding. And it looks at case studies globally um, and in the U.S. that are um, where artists are critical partners in many different ways. And you can go to the next slide, um, Mallory, because what was really important to us was to be very, very clear about exactly the ways that artists can be partners in this work because artists create their own work. They are also um, really integral as partners in other ways. So we um, identified five main ways that artists can amplify urgency, mitigate a climate threat, facilitating community-led solutions, communicating complex data and also innovating preparedness. So we wanted, especially people in the climate space and in climate work to really see very practical, um, clear ways that artists can start to be more integrated as, and see them as partners in this work. So these, these themes are throughout the publication. Next slide, please. Um, this just gives you a sense of um, what you can find, um, case studies in each of these areas a toolkit that really gives you practical information and also connection out to other resources in the field. And also a section called Public Art Now, which um, looks at climate projects and um, uh, by directly by artists around the world. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense of um, some of the stories in the publication, we really um, tried to look at projects that were um, based in community that were led by people of color, artists of color, designers of color, um, and that were really meeting uh, um, an important community need and the community was benefited, particularly communities who are most impacted by climate challenges and the climate crisis. Um, so we'll find you'll find those kind of themes throughout the publication. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just one of the examples. Heat extremes is one of our topic areas. Um, you'll be able to dig into some of the stories and images and links out to, to these projects throughout the throughout the U.S. So um, before I turn it over to Mallory, just um, an invitation to stay connected with us, um, read the publication, connect with us if we should find out about more projects that are going on. We always like to update the toolkit in particular so that we can add more resources, we can add more connections for people to find out more about this work. And also that we'll be having more conversations like this coming up. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Mallory. Um, Mallory Roxana Nazem is our curator of partnerships and programming for Forward and has been one of the um, founding partners and um, curators of Forward since the beginning. So I'm gonna hand it over to you and thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks, Teresa. Hi everyone, Mallory Roxana Nazem. Um, I am so excited to be leading this conversation today. Um, I have had the joy of participating in all of the forward conversations, but I have to say this issue on climate is the nearest and dearest to my heart. Uh, I'm also so excited that we're hosting this in the midst of COP29. Is that the right number? I believe it's 29. Um, so this is such an urgent issue um, and the time is really now to be thinking about the ways in which so many sectors can collaborate and absolutely the arts. So I'm going to introduce you to our panelists today. We have Emma Robbins. Emma, you can wave and let folks know who you are. Emma is a Diné artist, activist, and community organizer, the managing director of Planet Women, which is a nonprofit partnering with femmes and women to create a healthy planet for all life. Prior to that, Emma was the ED of the Navajo Water Project 
where she collaborated with communities on the Navajo Nation to get clean running water to one in three Navajo families without it. Um, Emma is the founder of the Chapter House, which she is sitting in right now, which is an indigenous women-led community art space in LA designed for natives and welcoming to all. And her work centers around community collaboration, education, and indigenization. So welcome, Emma. Thanks for being here. Travis Sheridan is the Chief Community Officer at Wexford Science and Technology, where he forges strong ties with university partners, civic leaders, and community groups to develop knowledge communities. And his key responsibility there is to foster, foster inclusive environments in each city, they work in many cities, to lead community engagement strategies and to form new partnerships. And he also oversees uh, Wex Wexford SciTech Seed Fund as the investment committee chair. Welcome, Travis. And lastly, uh, Galen Troyer, who leads climate tech and economic innovation for Miami-Dade County. And he works in the private sector to pursue the county's climate resilience goals to catalyze regional investment in blue, green, and climate technology. And he does that by bringing together a network of entrepreneurs, of investors, businesses, academics, and community leaders. So welcome, Galen. Thank you all for being here. Um, so these are our panelists. And before we, we dig into Q and A's with our panelists, I wanna let y'all know that at the bottom of your screen, there's a little box um, that says Q and A, and that's where throughout the conversation today, if you have any questions, you can submit your questions down there. And at the um, kind of end of our conversation, we'll bring the audience in, we'll bring your questions in. So put your questions there as you have them throughout the conversation. Um, and then we wanted to start with a poll for our audience to participate in. So we're gonna pull that poll up right now. My colleague, Jen, is gonna do that. So if you all would take a moment here and panelists, you can also fill this out too, if you'd like. So this, this is just a, a sense of what are the climate issues going on in your community? community right now. So we want to just get a sense of what, what are folks dealing with who are participating in this conversation today or who are listening in. And you should be able to see the results coming in live. I'm not sure. I think you all can. Um, but I'm seeing um, air pollution looks like a very high issue as well as loss of wildlife. Um, agriculture, food insecurity, severe storms, heat, uh, natural disasters. Yeah. Um, looks like we're, yeah. Jen, do you mind um, going ahead and putting the results up? Or maybe these are the results. Great. Can you all see the um, panelists? Are you able to see it? Okay, great. So if we just take kind of a high look here, it looks like from what I can see, the number one issue in this room right now is heat. Um, so with about 59% of the folks participating, so that heat is an issue. And then we've also got a lot of folks dealing with severe storms in their communities, air pollution, um, and then loss of wildlife. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of votes for a lot of these things. So clearly there are um, a lot of similar challenges that we're facing in communities, as well as I'm sure some things that are pretty distinct to our geographies. And thanks to folks who are putting things in the chat that we don't have um, on this list because it's not comprehensive. And thanks, Jen, you can take the poll down now. Great, thank you, all right. Okay, panelists, so um, I first wanna kick it off with a question for all of you, um, and then we'll go into some specific questions for individual panelists. So this first question to all of you is, 
is kind of building off of that poll that we just took. What are the major climate challenges facing your community or communities and or your sector? Um, and so in forward, we are we're focusing in this issue on air pollution, heat extremes, floods, and population displacement. And then we saw some of the issues that our audiences are facing. Um, so, and there are obviously more. So curious, what what are what's really top of mind for you in the work that you're doing and in the communities um, that you're, you're working with? And I'm gonna kick it off first with Emma. I'm one of the water insecurity people out of that poll. I'm going to speak specifically about the Navajo Nation because obviously I don't speak for every indigenous person in the so-called U.S. or anywhere else, but water insecurity is a huge thing for us. And 30% of Navajos living on the reservation don't have access to clean running water. There are a lot of smaller things that contribute to that. Like when we're seeing changes in weather, there are roads that are destroyed or there are wells that are no longer in service. So it's not just about not having existing water, but it's about barriers that come into that when we're trying to solve these problems. When I first started doing water work seven and a half years ago, um, there was a lot of rainfall, there was a lot of snow, and so we were seeing wells that were thriving. However, we then started to plan a new well and started to dig that but it started coming up dry because of changes in the water um, aquifers. And so that's something that's really hitting us hard. And, you know, there are secondary things that go on. So when people have to relocate because of lack of water or because of changes in the weather, um, we're losing traditional culture because they're no longer allowed to stay in their homelands or our homelands and they're moving to larger cities or need to move away from things like traditional farming practices or holding our traditional ceremonies or even being present with other Dinehbizad speakers. And so that is also eliminating language as well. And as we know, as soon as we start to lose language, we start to lose huge chunks of who we are as a people. So it's not just that things are changing in terms of climate or you know, water is disappearing, but there are a lot of other things that are affected by that. So sometimes it can feel like we're trying to fix one thing and it's going to solve the lack of water, but it's not happening fast enough. And for those of you who are from reservations or who have worked on reservations, things are already moving so slow because of the red tape from different governments, state, federal, county, and tribal. It's not just about climate, it's about cultural preservation. And that's something that is super important to me and other folks that I work with who are also traditional Navajos. I appreciate you lifting up um, that cultural preservation element. And I think also helping to kick us off by framing, uh, it's almost kind of softening the line of where climate starts and stops this issue that it really bleeds into so many other um, other issues. So I'm going to ask Travis for you to join us next. Yeah, thanks. And it's great to be here. It's nice to see all the participants actively on the polls and, and expressing their, their top concerns. Uh, these are all things that if we don't address them now, uh, and unfortunately, I don't think as a society we are addressing them adequately, uh, then we're, you know, what does the next generation, the future generations really uh, in, inherit? Uh, through, you know, as a real estate developer, we re I look at this in a very different way, in a, in a, but I'm, I'm glad to be part of this conversation just as much to share perspectives, but also to learn from the other panelists. I would say that the, the top items, in, and we work in 17 different markets across the United States, and it, it almost feels like each market has their own unique challenges uh, when it comes to climate resilience. Uh, you know, if I think about some of our projects in either, you know, in the in the Phoenix area or in Central California and Southern California, of course, water, heat, uh, displacement of populations is really critical. Uh, 
Food insecurity seems to be common across multiple populations, not always as a result of climate uh, change, but oftentimes it's a result of lost population due to gentrification, harmful gentrification and displacement, and then uh, neighborhoods becoming food deserts. Uh, but one of the things that we see as it relates to climate change is when at, related to the food insecurity is just the uh, reduction of uh, a lack of availability of fresh produce, fresh food, healthy food, and that type of that type of thing that. Uh, then only allows for unhealthy items to be around, and then that creates healthcare issues longer term. Uh, I would also say that you know when we look at the loss of way of life, that is that's really critical. And, and Emma brought up a really good point as it relates to loss of language, loss of culture. Uh, you know, as real estate developers, we we can either exacerbate horrible conditions by continuing to eliminate and erase uh, the way of life for the surrounding communities. Uh, or we could find a way, especially through the arts and through inclusive development, to be uh, to make sure that we maintain the the culture that is there and the way of life isn't isn't compromised. Uh, so I look forward to uh, more of this conversation and also being challenged. And uh, you all can be very critical of my industry because I am. Thanks for the invitation, Travis. Um... Galen. Yes, me. Great. Okay. Hi, I'm Galen. I work in climate. I was also was an artist for about 10 years in the Twin Cities doing mostly performance. Um, and I like, I could go on and on about the, the risks and the dangers in Miami. Um, we are the most financially vulnerable community in possibly in the world. I don't know. It's it's that's like such a weird thing. And this gets at what Travis is saying. It's mostly real estate value down here. But real people live here. A lot of people, about three million in the county, uh, maybe six ish million in the in the broader community. Um, and our top risks are sea level rise, extreme storms so flooding and winds and then really high heat. And, and I can tell you, the community has been saying high heat for a long time, but we're, we now have a chief heat officer, and I think that that has helped bring attention. And interestingly, she was also uh, in the arts in the past and was a, a foundation program officer funding in the arts. And I think that there is something in that space, you know, this overlap of people who have been in the community, have worked in arts and are around climate, um, who are have the capacity to actually listen to what is happening. Because this is just super systemic. And it, I think that maybe if I'm going to impress you all with one thing, we have not uh, achieved the emissions reductions that we need to, to avert really intense climate impacts. So that's going to happen. And it's happening now. And what we should expect in the future is that this risk of the climate impacts is going to increase. And so we are going to suffer other impacts. And I, one of the thing, the thing I work on the most right now is economic impact and how we can transform our economy in a way that works for everyone. And historically, what we have done, uh, what we know is that despite best efforts, the money we poured into adaptation has generally led to greater inequality and it has led to displacement of communities. And generally, that's not what we want. That's not what I want. It's not what my mayor wants or what our community wants. And so we have to figure that out. And, and I guess we can talk more about art, but like that's the, <laughs> that is part of it. Artists are definitely displaced in my community in Miami all the time. It's really challenging. I know many artists, I've been here 10 years and I know many artists who have left because our um, cost of living has gone up a lot and our re our the real estate values for median home is almost doubled in the last few years and, and rents have similarly skyrocketed. Thanks, Galen. Actually, I, I do, I would love to pull that thread before we get into our direct questions. If other panelists have thoughts that they wanna share about the economic um, environment surrounding changes as a result of climate change.
I will, and this will actually address the question that popped up in the Q and A. Uh, you know, I think that all too often the the built environment has leaned on you know lead certification, you know, gold, silver, platinum, what have you, uh, as as the uh, the 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 benchmark in which to achieve, and and I think that that is still a good threshold to try to achieve. The downside is that really only addresses how the building is built and not how the buildings operate. And I think that you know the more we just we're we're I'm happy that we're building our first net zero building in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which took a, amazing investment, incredible investment in order to get to that point. Uh, but it was really driven by some of our uh, some of our partners. Uh, primarily Atrium Health uh, that wanted to make sure that if we are going to build these buildings, not only do they uh, hit a design standard, but they hit an operating standard as well. Um, and that is something that we, I think that the built environment can continue to do. It, it just requires looking at uh, looking at the economics a bit differently, uh, but also realizing that it's a it's more of a long term play as opposed to an, an immediate uh, you know play. And I will say that tenants now, I mean tenants are also driving. And tenants uh, are driving the expectation that they are working within either health, uh, following healthy building standards or net zero standards or something along those lines because their employees are, are requiring that. I can touch on that a little bit. So, you know, in terms of being a Diné woman, I have my connections to the reservation, whether it's working there, having family, being there. Up until recently, I was splitting my time between the Navajo Nation on the Western side and Los Angeles. And thinking about sort of economics, I mean, we don't generally have developers who are coming to the reservation to build things. Um, a lot of times what we're seeing, however, like with the Colorado River and water rights when it comes to that, development off reservation in other areas especially like states like Arizona, which I have many opinions on, um, but they're taking a lot more water and that affects who we as Diné people or other native nations function. You know, the development of um, real estate or things like mines that are trying to be proposed and implemented on reservations or directly off where we rely on water we're seeing that these are continuations of erasures of treaties. And so it's not just about taking our water, but it's about saying, JK, this doesn't actually mean anything. So we're going to let people trample all over this treaty and have access to this water or be able to run lines through your land to bring coal to another area. Um, and that's a really big problem because we're suffering on a res when we don't actually see the things that we need like water rights. I'm sure many of us have been keeping up or kept up with the case in the Supreme Court with the Navajo Nation and other states. And that's just proof that as we continue to develop and we meaning as the United States or corporations, not myself, I guess, continue to develop these things, we're losing water. And so we're suffering greatly. The Navajo Nation also relies very heavily on tourism as we are close to the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. And that's a big issue when we continue to develop these things because we as the Navajo Nation or as tribal enterprises are losing that money as well. Um, when I think about the cost of living and economics there, on the reservation, people can't afford gas that's $4 a gallon when you're making $8 an hour. It just doesn't make sense. And people are having to drive miles on end to get to other areas because we're so dispersed and spread out. Our reservation, if it were a state, it would be the 10th largest. If it were a country, it'd be the size of Ireland. And so you can see how someone might need to go from point A to point B, and it can be up to an hour. And we are already spread out across this huge swath of land. And so when people can't travel or when they can't afford gas, it continues to keep us siloed. And when we can't come together, we're not making big things happening. Like, or happen, like fighting oil, gas, uranium, again, this huge erasure of treaties. And so I think there are the much smaller things that add up. And in addition to that, what we're seeing with economics, and I, I keep referencing gas, but it's something that we do so often is travel. We can't access clean water. 
And a lot of times people will go to water sources that are unsafe where there are uranium or they can't go to stores to buy bottled water. And that's really affecting us. Thank you all for helping set kind of the bigger context of this conversation. Um, I know we're, so we, we are together to talk about the role of artists in all of this. And there are, you know, so many challenges uh, as you've all articulated. And, and yet we know that um, there are so many skills that artists have, so many gifts that artists have that can really be vital in um, solving, addressing a lot of these challenges that you all are articulating. So I'm gonna go with to some individual questions, starting with you, Galen, and we're gonna hone in on Miami-Dade County. And I'd love for you to talk a bit more about um, what artists are doing in Miami-Dade County, uh, what kind of impacts you're, you're seeing artists or art, art initiatives have um, on climate change and in, in that conversation in your region. Yeah, hey. Uh... I am very lucky to have a lot of artist friends and to live in this community that is rich in art. We have Art Basel or Miami Art Week happening right now where the art world comes here and parties. And it has been going on for about 20 years. And then I, my understanding, I've only been here 10 years, but that was pretty catalytic. It brings a lot of the art market influence down, which is complicated. Um, and, and I think that, but it's also like creates energy. And I think that that is super, super important. Um, Miami-Dade is 65% non-native or non-US born, right? So people born outside of the US. And then also a lot of people like me who are tran like transplants to the community. And that means that there isn't, there is a, a fractured history, let's say, right? It's not that there isn't a history, there is a history but we are really hard on the environment here. It's super abundant. And it's also like totally covered in stuff, uh, people and development. Real estate developers are kings here and have been forever. But it goes through cycles and we have new people all the time. And I'm saying all this because I think artists think about that past and they think about the future. Those are the ones that I am super inspired by. They remind us of where we came from or where they came from. I, I know many folks who are say from Venezuela or Cuba and they're coming out of uh, you know some somewhat of a traumatic experience or a def definitely traumatic experience and expressing themselves here is important. Um, and I think that is also true for white artists who are you know, in a minority here and carry this history of the space that is like deeply, deeply changed environmentally, right? So there are, I think we have native artists as well. And I would say native and white artists who've been here for the most generations. And I see their ability to tap into what the environment is and share that with folks, because it's really important. If you can't look at the land and go back in history, you can't look forward, right? And that's there's like some psychology around that, but that's part of the thing that I'm seeing. So like one example is uh, this artist, Lee Pivnik is doing a collective project called Symbiotic House. And it's about imagining the houses of the future. And it's a lecture series that happens in different places. It's also a residency at uh, a county owned facility. It's also online conversations. And ultimately it could also be a collective house, a place where people could live. Um, I have also, I'm really also into the work that's happening at Bass Fisher Invitational. They've done a lot and got a, uh, a national, uh, an, uh, an NEA award, but also I think there's an EPA component to it. Uh, and this work is really, Great. I can I could like go on and reference things if you want. I can drop some stuff in the chat for people, um, but I will pass it on now. Thanks, Galen. Yeah, feel free to drop some of your favorite artists right now in the chat. Um, I know when Galen and I first met, um, you were you were excited about so many projects in 
Miami-Dade County. You got me excited. Um, Emma, I'm gonna go to you. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, so often in these kind of cross-sector spaces that artists work in, artists are kind of the nice to have, but the not necessary, you know, kind of added an, an addition. Um, and what we really try to challenge with the forward series and the publication is um, that artists should really be can can and and should be considered as uh, as central to collaborations, and in some contexts even as leaders um, in climate work. So I'm wondering if you can share a bit more about artists as leaders and artists as really central to this work and not just additions. Yeah, I'll also say Galen, a huge part of why I left the art world was Basel. I think art fairs are like disgusting on so many levels. So I would love to talk more about that with you offline. I can remember- well, we and we could do it here too. <laughs> no, for sure. Basel, I hope you're listening. No, I'm just kidding. But um, this is actually related to that, to both your really great question, Mallory, and also what you were saying um, earlier, Galen, is Galen is I can pinpoint the moment when I was sitting at dinner and I was actually listening to people talk about valuing art and how it was so popular and it was a black artist and they were going to wrap it away so that I would increase in value. And I was like, I'm ready to move on from this. And I thought from that, it was really interesting because, you know, all the other alternative art fairs that come out of it is really great because it makes it accessible to other people to have these conversations. I also just dropped a link to one of my favorite pieces that was created during Basel a couple years ago, which was an augmented reality piece about climate change. Um, but Mallory, to get back to your question, I think when we start placing value or incorporating arts into these projects, we are tapping into things like traditional knowledge and culture and helping with community organization. And so as an artist myself, a lot of the work that I make is actually about treaties. And so offering visuals as to what that looks like, you know, and encouraging people to call upon our elected officials and say, bro, you like need to uphold these things and we need to modernize them. You know, let's include things like internet or broadband. We saw at the beginning of the pandemic, how many students and how many people were struggling to study and work from home because we didn't have access to these things. So it's not just about water, it's not just about railways, but it's about really bringing these treaties up to 2023. I think, when you can communicate with people outside of jargon that's used by the EPA, whether that's Navajo Nation or the federal government, and say, this is actually like coming together when we create things and based in arts, people are much more likely to be open to you and say, you are tradition, you are practicing our traditional arts or our traditional methods. Um, and just getting the message out there and doing things like ethical storytelling and collaboration um, all of us on this call, I think, can agree that that is so important when you're tapping into the community and actually incorporating the things that they want when you're designing projects, whether it's real estate, whether it's arts, whether it's clean water projects. And so that's something that needs to go hand in hand when we're thinking about these things. I always sort of crack up when we're watching movies or TV and there's like the person that they perceive as the artist and it's like something that's so wild and is not really what a real artist would do. And we also need to combat those stereotypes because it's not like the arts are separate from everything. It's in all of our lives, but again, especially as a Native woman, it's important to have those skills and those tools because as I get older and writing becomes a lot larger part of the things that I do, I've realized that I don't like doing writing. I like storytelling, which is a form of art. And also, again, making visual representation so people can understand things and actually want to participate. The arts are a part of everything, absolutely. Um, Travis, I'm hoping we can talk a bit about that and how it shows up in your industry. So my question for you, um, you kind of, 
you 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 led with this in um your first response which is that we, we know development has a mixed history um, when it comes to the environment often negative um so i'm curious how is your interest in, your industry and, and how is your industry thinking about climate change and where do you see opportunities um, to kind of push the industry to be more thoughtful about climate change and specifically how could artists be a part of that? Yeah, and so, you know, just a little bit of background. I was in preparation for this panel, I was trying to think about like, how long has this been important to me? Like this idea that public art and real estate need to go hand in hand. And I actually found an article I wrote back in 2008 titled Squirrels and Stucco Don't Count as Public Art. Uh, this is when I was living in Fresno, California. So, you know, there's a lot of stucco out there. Uh, and it was, it, so this has been a, a long time passion for me, even before I was in real estate development, uh, really when I was just looking more in the world of revitalization and downtown revitalization and the role that artists play in just improving the quality of life in the, in the cities in which we live. Uh, and so now that I have this role working for a, a fairly large developer and, you know, we only work, I, we work in multiple markets, but we only work with universities and we, and we create these uh, knowledge districts or knowledge communities or innovation districts with universities. And so we really do create convening places. And so it's a great opportunity to convene the convene artists to help us shape the discussions uh, of what, you know, one, what's the store, what are the, what are the stories of the local community? But secondly, how do we use art to have some of our more difficult conversations, some of those difficult conversations being around climate change and climate resilience? Uh, you know, there, there are some things that we can do as an industry that, uh, that I think can be policy driven, right? Uh, where we work in some cities in which there is a uh, a public art uh, component, you know, whether it's half a percent of the built built cost or one percent of the built cost. I think those are great. I think more of those things need to happen. Uh, as a developer, we we already plan. We have a line item for for public art uh, in in our budgets. Uh, but at the same time, we know that you know other developers may not make that same commitment, uh, and so it, sometimes policy helps drive that. Uh, the challenge is, you know, when you have that line item, how do you make sure that that uh, those dollars are being spent truly in public art and not just in what I might call interior decoration, right? I think there's so, so many ways to cheat the budget uh, to go down to home goods or something along those lines or whatever and, and just use that budget for, uh, for interior decorating instead of using that budget for truly public art purposes. Um, you know, I'm really proud of a project we're doing in, in Philadelphia with Nina Cook John, uh, amazing artist and architect. Um, we need, you know, we have an outdoor outdoor plaza. We needed a shade structure. There is a way that we could build a shade structure that's simply a piece of architecture, or we could use this opportunity to make it a piece of art and public art. And so we went the route of saying, why don't we find more ways to take these functional pieces that we need and turn them into functional pieces of art? And Nina and her team have not only are not only creating a functional piece of art, but embedded in this structure is also uh, and some audio recordings directly from the neighborhood, telling the stories of the neighborhood. Uh, and it and so this is, and the the way they they gathered all this information uh, was through a series of uh, block parties as as their neighborhood engagement and community engagement. So I think that there are ways that real estate developers can use public art and money that we're going to spend anyway. I think that the thing that I really encourage my my peers in the sector to do is not look for not necessarily look for new money to spend, but me, be more intentional with the money you're already planning on spending. Now, when it comes to like longer term engagement with the artists, there's a couple of things that we see as as paramount. One, uh, you know, as a company, a lot of our efforts uh, and programmatic efforts or when we're convening have a tendency to be around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We think that that's a great framework to get people talking and to create uh, different topics of conversation and, in, uh, and implementation of solutions. Uh, the second piece is in a number of our markets, it's a rel relatively new process for us, but we are something we are rolling out in each of our markets. Uh, we're taking a, a portion of the rent each year and putting it into a pool of resources that the community gets to dictate how those dollars are spent. Uh, we can, we call it our uh, community advisory council, and they get to they get to uh, commit to this uh, or prioritize this. Uh, the way the reason we do this is we you know we often talk about bringing people around the table, but 
agency is only good if you give people resources, right? Uh, you, can, you don't want to just bring people around the table and not give them resources to act. And so while it may not be a small, a large amount uh, on an annual basis, it's somewhere around one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars each year. Uh, I have I used to run nonprofits. I remember thinking to myself, if somebody told me that for the next sixty five years of this ground lease, I'm going to have at least two hundred thousand dollars every January first. What can I do with that sort of uh, baseline? And so creating this type of investment that we are willing to take from our from our rents and putting it directly into the hands of the community that can go toward things like public art. And by the way, the community gets to prioritize how those dollars are spent every year, mainly because we know, and, and I nego I've negotiated several community benefit agreements. The challenge I have with CBAs sometimes is they are negotiated based on needs at a point in time, and they don't really allow for the, the needs of the community to change over time. And so while we still will negotiate and enter into CBAs when necessary, as if that's the best outcome for the community, we also want to create this mechanism where the community can address the changing needs of the community over time and have resources to address those needs. So if transportation is a big need one year or child care is a big need the next year or public art is a big need, that's not for the developer to decide. That's for the community to decide that's living in the surrounding areas. Um, so I think those like it always comes down to an economic decision, right? I mean, at, at the end, as a developer, it you know, do we are we willing to make the investments in our surrounding communities? Uh, and I can say selfishly, it's still a good ROI. Like I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it's that it's purely altruistic because it it's not. It does make the 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 neighborhoods the the communities that much more. Uh, desirable. We can have a whole separate conversation about gentrification and displacement because we are very uh, cognizant of that, and we know that our history, our industry has a horrible uh, history at that. Especially when you use art to beautify a neighborhood, and then the the communities that help beautify it can no longer afford to live there. Very similar to what Galen was talking about. Um, we want to make sure that as we are. Uh, creating this economic mobility that the surrounding community, especially the artists and those that are most fragile, have an opportunity to participate in that upside. Thanks, Travis. And um, for those that aren't familiar with those percent for art ordinances, many cities, communities around the country have these percent for art ordinances. You can look them up, maybe see if there's one by you, um, where developers have to make commitments around uh, public art. I also just want to uplift, I think, that really concrete example of shade structures. You know, if you're already building something like that as a developer and thinking about, um, you know, that is a climate issue, have have those that kind of infrastructure, what could it look like to actually work with an artist on that? Um, I think that's a great example. I wanted to bring in our audience again and do another poll as we move to focus a bit more on the role of artists. Um, and I'll let Jen pull that pull up. So in, in our, our upcoming issue, we focus on five ways that artists are impacting the, uh, the climate sector. And these are the five ways. Um, so our question to you all is, what are you seeing artists doing in this space? Um, are you seeing artists amplifying urgency, directly mitigating climate threats, facilitating community-led solutions, communicating complex, data, I think, Emma, you talked a little bit about that um, legibility, and then innovating preparedness. So what are you seeing maybe within your own community, or what are you kind of seeing as you read news articles or look on the internet? What are artists doing in this climate space? Um, seeing that a lot of folks are witnessing this amplification of urgency of the issues around climate change, um, as well as communicating complex data. Um, I was just digging into Mona Chalabi's work the other day. It's an artist that works with data and, and does a great job of that. And definitely has some climate issues that she illustrates. Um, also, a lot of you are seeing artists facilitate community-led solutions and definitely a lot of stories in our upcoming issue about that. And I'm sure many of the examples, Galen, that you dropped in the chat, artists are doing that as well. Um, we can go ahead and close the poll and share it out, Jen. Yeah, so here's just a snapshot of what we heard from folks. So it's interesting. Um, obviously, there are other things that are not on this list, but it's interesting to see that 
the lowest votes are on directly mitigating climate threats. So being able to, to uh, you know, directly minimize a harm firsthand. And, you know, artists can't do everything. There's some things that we do really well. Um, I think that, that that direct mitigation is still a challenge, but a place of a lot of opportunity and collaboration. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this poll down. Um, and then I'm gonna ask some questions to all of you and you can feel free to just take yourself off mute whenever you wanna chime in um, and just speak your mind. So I am gonna kind of build off of that last poll. So those are the five ways in which um, in the issue of forward coming up that we focus on the role that artists play. Um, and again, they are amplifying urgency, urgency, directly mitigating climate threats, facilitating community-led solutions, communicating complex data and innovating preparedness. And I can put those, I'll just put those in the chat for everyone so you can, yeah, see those, those five ways. Um, so my question for you all is, are any of these, these ways that artists are working particularly resonant to you? Um, if you are an artist, are you working in any of these ways? If you're not an artist, are you witnessing artists working in these ways? Are you collaborating with artists at all working in these ways? That's the question. I'll I'll jump in first. I I think for a lot of the work that we're doing at Wexford, it's you know working with artists to communicate complex data, but also working with artists to help communicate and drive conversations around complex topics. Um, I think one of the things that I've always appreciated about the arts, uh, as both a collector of arts, patron of the arts, and artist myself, is that the ability to take something that's complex and position it in a new way that uh, maybe causes a, a different level of curiosity or brings a different type of conversation into the mix. Uh, I had, there was a, I'm based in St. Louis. We had this really, this is not about climate change, but it's about artists playing an interesting role in conversation. We had an event in St. Louis where the entire theme was risk one night. And on the panel was an artist and an, uh, I'm sorry, a, a lawyer and an acrobat sitting side by side talking about risk from their perspective. And I think one third of the people were there to see the artists or the acrobat, one third were there to see the attorney and a third were there to see the, the train wreck that they thought would occur. But you know, we, we take this complex topic like risk and we only assume people in the business sector that wanna talk about risk are gonna talk about risk. But we really should talk about the, the role that artists or that risk plays in the arts as well. And so I think you know, when we have this cross sector opportunity and bringing artists into conversations where they historically haven't been, uh, you know, I think, all too often we think if we're gonna solve climate change, then we need all the scientists in the room to tell us the science solution to climate change. When in reality, uh, artists view and think about and process the world differently. Uh, I truly believe that artists, we, we use the word innovation now, but artists have been doing that type of thing uh, since the beginning. That is what art is, uh, is a form of innovation. Uh, so bringing artists into these conversations and really blending the, the line that, uh, that used to exist, the hard line that used to exist between having science, scientists leave science conversation and only allowing artists to have, you know, fluffy arts conversations. If we think of most of the social change um, that's happened in this country, a lot of it has been led by and driven by artists. And I think if we're going to look at novel solutions for climate change, art uh, scientists are going to be part of that, but I think artists are going to really uh, help us spark the, the true innovations that will lead to better solutions. I'll just jump in and say, click on some of those links that I shared. The artists are doing all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the things that I do just want to acknowledge is it's hard to be a professional artist. And um, per what Emma was saying about Basil, my my sense of, of Art Basil in Miami is mostly that it's a real estate play. It gets very wealthy people here every year at a great time of year. And there are a lot of real estate people around selling real estate. They also sell art, but it, I think that that has been a big part of what it is. And that's opened up opportunities for artists into spaces that where real estate developers partnered with them and some have been in really good faith. And most of them have ultimately led to some sort of displacement, but also Ulay Arts is very complicated. Ulay Arts 
is probably the one of the most well endowed arts organizations, local arts organizations in the country because they sold a building a building for eighty eight million dollars that they bought for six hundred thousand, and it's complicated, you know, it's complicated, and I think that artists are able to handle that complexity and they're unwilling to let go of the reality that they see which is different than the one that the that a lot of people see and live in right and so you can look at the climate crusader and alex sees the world differently and you know he can have a very cogent conversation with you about climate change but is also deeply an artist connected on different planes, you know, in a way that is really essential that they can be here. Um, because it would be it would be hard, it's hard for him to show up in that way in a in the public discourse without doing it as an artist, right? People will literally say you're crazy. And and the, the force that is coming down on us from climate change is really, really intense. So I think one of the things that I'm recognizing in Miami where we're feeling these impacts pretty regularly is that artists are asking, what about like my mental health and happiness? How can my art, how can us doing this work of making art together in space uh, be a healing? And it's just an active process. It's not, I can't say that anything has been found, but it's helpful. I have so many tabs open right now, Galen, that I can't wait to look at afterwards. Um, and I appreciate you educating me and sharing this with everybody because these are things that I, like this question, I'm like, wait, who do I know specifically? Um, I think thinking a little bit more about groups or collectives like K Info Shop, which I'll drop in here, is a really cool org that's based in Window Rock on the Navajo Nation. And they're doing education around complex issues with climate change, but also bringing people together to even identify what they're experiencing and offering aid. Um, I think back to doing work on the Navajo Nation during the height of the pandemic and you know, indirectly the spread of COVID across the Navajo Nation. At one point we had the highest infection rate, at another point we had the highest death rate in the world, not only in the United States. And it was something that we just hadn't come across before. I mean, how to communicate this, right? So we had to invent new words for what COVID even meant, which was um, talking about big cough or how to educate other people. They came up with a campaign, the health department on the res, which was keeping people apart. So it'd say like, keep two the beh or two sheep apart. And so relaying this information, it wasn't just one artist, but it was a lot of Navajo people coming together and saying, how are we going to communicate this? You know, lack of water really led to us having a lot more spread. Um, because we couldn't wash our hands, but we also couldn't distance ourselves from others. We had to go and haul water from different points. And so thinking about that more from the public health side, it was really important to be able to communicate this. And like I said, translate these words into Navajo, which I strongly believe our language is an art in itself because of how beautiful it is and how you shape the way that you speak, depending on who you're talking to or what you're talking about. Um, further up in the chat, I dropped Nancy Baker Cahill, who's an amazing artist who works a lot in the AR or the augmented reality sphere. And I know um, in major cities, she has done projects where we're discussing climate change. I did a collaboration with her um, and other artists where we were asked to create pieces for AR in Washington, D.C., and some people did things that were related to climate change, um, specifically about farming practices. I, uh, of course, did something about treaties, and that was really great because most days most people have smartphones, right? And so what they needed to do was download the app when they were in D.C., they could go and hold their phone up and, and see these pieces of work. But Nancy also created an app where people can view it anywhere with the app on their phone. It doesn't need to be a geolocation. Um, and I think, although that's not directly 
talking about climate change, it is pointing people to the other works. And I think sometimes that's sort of how you draw people in to have these difficult conversations. Uh, Travis, you had talked about um, having difficult convos when it comes to art and relaying that information. And I think a lot of times I'm asked, well, how do you be a good ally? Or how do I learn more about native issues and how that is affecting communities um, and the environment? And I always say, well, indigenize your feed, right? Start following these accounts or start following this hashtag and you'll get into this rabbit hole. And I think that's the great thing about arts is once we start sharing something that someone might be interested in, it opens up ways to not only have difficult conversations about the environment or public health, but also come up with new ways to share it and make it a lot more widespread. Um, but again, Galen, thank you, because I am very much looking forward to looking at all of these. Going to block out my lunchtime and just consume all of it. Our, uh, the forthcoming issue, this issue on climate will also hopefully provide you all with a lot of great uh, case studies to, to do during your lunch break on Tuesday when it comes out. Um, so, so for the forward series is very interested in this cross sector space. As Teresa mentioned, we've gone through uh, many sectors and we're talking about climate today. Um, but within that, we're, re we're, we're also interested in, in thinking kind of more at the system level and the changes that can um, that can occur there, the kind of impact that, occur, that can occur at that level. So given that y'all work in in kind of different ways in different industries, but I'll touch on climate and I'll touch on art, um, what are some of the, the structural changes that might need to happen for artists to be more part of this climate work that's needed? Structural changes that that might need to happen. They need they need money. If they're living in the U.S., they need money, and I I'm. It's just very real. I lived on less than thirty thousand dollars, or about thirty thousand dollars a year through my twenties. Um, and I realize now that I have less money than other people and less status. And I think in this country money is status and money is access. And um, if you don't have it, you can't have a house, you can't have a studio, people are less likely to let you in. And I think a big part of what I experienced as an artist is that I still had access, right? You get access, you just don't have the money to afford everything that the other people who have access have. Um, so, but, but I just like basic living expenses. If Miami is the future of climate for the rest of the country, it is, we are the most expensive place to live in the country with the highest inflation rate. And it's really, really tough. So, you know, I know artists who moved to Knoxville and in Knoxville, they're saying, it's getting more expensive here. What's going on? <laughs> you know, and it's, we, we're pushing it around. That's an interesting paradox, Galen, that, you know, in one of the mo one of the communities in the country that has some of the most vital climate change issues that like the hardest place for artists to live and make work, even though we really need them to. What other kinds of structural changes do we need? I mean, I, I think, and it just comes back to, for me, getting more people around the table and removing some of those barriers that, that prevent people from, so, you know, my industry, because we work so much with universities, the, uh, I'm not going to bemoan somebody for getting advanced education or getting a bachelor's degree or becoming a PhD. I think that that's, that's great. But I, I think all too often my industry, uh, because we work with universities, hold up academic credentials as as a point of entry have have held up academic credentials as a point of entry to even have a seat around the table for far too long uh, instead of just viewing really everybody you interact with as a contributor in some way shape or form whether their their education has come through lived experience or their education and experience has come through being a practitioner uh, in a particular field for a, a long period of time uh, you know, we, we worked with the University of Maryland at Baltimore 
not not necessarily on art related issues, but uh, just on helping them re-rate their jobs. And overnight, 1,600 jobs went, within the university went from requiring a four-year degree to not requiring a four-year degree. Uh, those are structural changes that we need to see within multiple industries, but especially in industries where we want to have more artists. Uh, and we're seeing young people, whether it's Gen Z or even uh, younger at, at Gen Alpha, uh, we're seeing more and more young people not necessarily interested in pursuing higher education, but are com com incredibly talented with the with what they can bring to a table. The other, speaking of younger people, I think that's the other structural change is getting younger people around the table to have these conversations. Uh, you know, one of the things we look at is when we are putting these uh, community advisory councils together, there is an at-large, uh, there is a youth seat on that. Uh, and, you know, our, our premise has always been, we don't have a kid's table at Thanksgiving, right? If we're going to bring young younger people into the conversation, we're bringing them in to the quote unquote adult table or the single table that exists. Um, I, historically, and this is, I think every generation has experienced this, whether they are coming out of high school or coming out of university, uh, that challenge to penetrate and, and, as Galen said, get access to some of the, the conversations that need to take place, uh, giving young people that access uh, and validating their, their, even if it's short term, their lived experience and the way that they process information, I think, is a, is a structural change. Um, again, we're, we have to move away from academic credentials as being the you know, the, the table stakes for being part of a conversation. We also also have to, you know, as Galen said, pay people. You know, I think all too often we uh, we will invite art, uh, architects uh, to work with on projects and they have a rate and we're willing to pay that rate. Uh, but heaven forbid, if we bring an artist in and expect them to uh, sell them on the idea of exposure, uh, which I don't think anybody's been able to pay a utility bill or put food on their table as a result of exposure. Uh, so paying artists for their for their time and talents is really critical. Yeah, when you asked that question, Mallory, um, the first thing that came into my mind was that like emoji with its like tongue out and the dollar sign in its eyes because I mean, in the United States, as was already said, you know, you need money and that's basically like how you're going to get far in life, unfortunately. And so I think because not everyone's going to get access to that money, we have to come up with ways as artists and as communities that are often overlooked, we need to come up with ways to care for ourselves and to create spaces. And so I mean, it's hard to hustle out there, you know, whether you're working in the environmental sphere or the human rights. A lot of times, I think all of us have experienced this, not only as artists, but as nonprofit employees or founders or whatnot, where it's like, oh, you do such great work. That's so cool. I don't want to be a martyr. I want to like have my own garden at home and I want to take care of my two-year-old so, you know, she can go on and do these things. So for sure, money. Um you know, yes, 1% is great, but how much of a city or a government's budget goes to making the rich continue to make money? You know, let's make it 10%. Um, and I know things aren't just easy where people go in and say that, which again is why we have to come together and create spaces. I started the chapter house, which is a physical location as of September. And that's exactly what we're doing now because there aren't many spaces where indigenous peoples or our allies can come together. And so in those opportunities related to what you said, Travis, making sure that we're paying people when we ask them to do things, you know, are you going to come and talk about your art? Great. Here's the money. It's not a ton. I wish we could give people thousands and thousands, but having physical locations, as you said, Galen, not everyone can have a studio. I mean, me personally, I work out of my, kitchen I don't know what we call it where we eat sometimes and sometimes I hold zoom meetings but it's just not possible to get further on in life if we don't have resources like physical spaces money um Travis you said something about having younger people present I totally agree and I think breaking down those barriers when it comes to things like education you know I'm personally in debt for a lot of money and I probably looking back would have chosen to not go to art school because someone who has, I don't know, a medical degree or something else oftentimes owes less money than I do. School of the Art Institute, if you're on this call, please cancel my loans and stop hitting me up at Christmas time for donations. It's not going to happen. Um, 
but I say that jokingly, but it's true. Like we need to remodel how much things like education costs or allowing artists to have unions and have healthcare for ourselves. I think when you're making $30,000, like you said, Galen, and you have literally something broken or you're very sick, you're probably not going to be able to afford to go to a hospital. And that's unfortunate. And we need to take care of ourselves physically and mentally and not there being reactive, but being proactive and having moments when we can care for ourselves before it gets to the needle has gone through your finger as you're sewing um, jumpsuits for yourself to sell, which which has happened. Um, but I also think to get back to having younger people at the table, also incorporating elders and their wisdoms as well, because I think in this country, there's so much ageism and there's separation, whether it's elders, millennials, Gen Z, very young people, whatever it is, we need to start looking at us as a unit and not just these separations, but also really placing importance on what young people have to say um, and listening to our elders. Because as a Native woman, that's what I grew up my entire life was knowing that we need to look to elders, knowing that we need to look X amount of generations ahead whatever it is, but there needs to be a mind shift in what that looks like when it comes to coming together as communities. But again, insert like all the money emojis because that's really what we need. And not have restrictions as to how that money is spent. Grants and donors and foundations oftentimes place so much red tape on it that you can barely get anything done. You know, when the chapter house is applying for things um, and working in water for so long, people want to fund the sexy things like a water truck or a physical space. They don't want to pay for health insurance or oftentimes they don't want to pay to make sure that someone has a living wage um, and can buy a house or different things like that. Can I just add another thought that's coming up as I hear you talk about like indigenous communities, which are split, but like a lot of them are rural. You know, there are a lot of rural indigenous folks. And one of the things that I'm noticing in the 20 years that I've hung out with artists or 25 years um, that are adults, I've noticed that living in a city has just gotten a lot more expensive. Cities used to be the cheap place that you could live, right? Where you could live, you didn't have to necessarily have a car, you could like get the things that you needed. And then the other big main point was that you could meet the people you needed to meet. And now the cheaper places, they're, it's not entirely true because of Airbnb, but like rural places are cheaper, right? You can you can have um, maybe bought a house or you got a little money and you can buy a house in a rural space, but then you don't need each other. So maybe there's something structural in that that we can do to take advantage of the fact that artists are moving into less densely populated places and help them meet each other, right? Um, and I don't know what that is, but that is a structural thing that like, is it travel grants? Is it an expectation? Is it a tour? Is it a, how do you connect people? Because you don't get to run into them at the local spot, you know? And I think on top of that, a lot of the local spots like are not around anymore in Miami. They kind of, they're churning through. Yeah, and also just to, Add on to that, I think because so many people are in rural spots or because people in smaller cities or towns um, or reservations, whatever it looks like, are creating really cool projects, I think also amplifying those, right? And I love the idea of an exchange because that's what I see a lot being from the reservation. There is a lot of infighting between people from the res and, you know, so-called urban Indians. And so there also needs to be... Um, amplification of things that are going on in smaller communities. I was just in Mobile at the Alabama Contemporary Arts Center and had um, work in a group show there. And it was like mind blowing how much they're doing in Mobile. And it really required me to personally shift the way that I think about people in the South and the culture and artists there, because I think a lot of us who aren't from the South can agree there's so many things going on politically and it doesn't always feel the most welcoming for people of color, for queer folks, um, for artists. And so also amplifying those spaces and not turning up our noses, which I can very much admit that I've done and say, I would never go to Mobile. It's like the Alabama Contemporary Art Center is doing so many cool things. And I think 
there needs to be the exchange, like you said, Galen, and travel grants and whatever it looks like, but also not poo-pooing to the side, the people who are in rural spaces doing things, which again, I'm not saying anyone here is doing that, but I have very admittedly done it myself. Thank y'all. So many good things coming up. I'm all for these learning trips to do some travel grants. If you want to volunteer to help you with that. Um, I'm also hearing the importance of actually bringing people to, together to talk about these things. Um, and especially if we can do it physically because of how our communities are changing due to economic pressures and other reasons people are moving uh, you know, in, into different areas. Um, I'm hearing a lot of financial strain, but also how just providing more resources in this space could really change what artists are able to do. Um, I'm hearing this this theme that I'm really excited about. Uh, uh, if if climate work is really about the well being of our planet, it too has to be about the well being of the people who are working in this climate space, right? Including artists. Um, and there is a movement in, within the arts community right now for folks who are maybe less involved in the arts world that there, there are pilots going on around uh, universal base, basic income or guaranteed basic income for artists in particular in how um, something like $500 a month might change an artist's ability to just be well, be a, a healthy human, but also um, how does it open up their practice as an artist? Um, so lots of great work going on there. And then I also heard this theme of the importance of just intergenerational conversation and collaboration when we're looking at climate and art. I have just two more questions and then I wanna invite the audience. So just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, submit them to the Q&A because we're coming to your questions in a moment. Um, so this is kind of, we're kind of getting to the end of my questions. So thinking about for folks who wanna bring art and climate work together, maybe maybe are working on one side, but haven't bridged into the other yet. What are some ways that people, uh, or things people might need to think about if they want to kind of create those bridges? So might I, I'll, yeah, Travis, yeah, I was I'll, gonna yeah, say, yeah, how does that happen in your sector? I, it, I think that, you know, one of the one of the things that we, I would encourage artists to do is um, if your art involves, if your practice involves, uh, you know, creating pieces related to the climate crisis, then work on that narrative a bit more. Like, I think part of it is going back to what Emma said about storytelling. Like, I think artists, just like entrepreneurs, sometimes are really bad at telling their own story. Like, it's overly complex. So that's, I think, try to uh, find ways to tell the story so that so that the general public or a dumb developer would know that uh, you know the work that you're doing is related to climate change. Uh, again, a lot of people in my industry look at art merely as interior decorating, right? Like not not the opportunity to tell a bigger story. It's going to be harder for my industry to. It's going to be difficult for I just suddenly ask my industry to think about art differently. I'm going to put some of the onus and responsibility on the artist to get better at talking about why their practice directly relates to climate change and then allow some of the allies on the inside, you know, folks like me and others to say, okay, let's, let's do more of this. Let's tell these stories. But I think it comes down to just being a little bit more of a storyteller, a better storyteller of how your art directly relates to, uh, to climate change. The other thing, and it goes, this does go to my industry of where my industry needs to close the gap a little bit as well is viewing any challenge as if we are humans and we have two sides of our brain. I think all too often we look for the logical solution and the people we invite around the table are just all the left brain people, as opposed to saying, if we're gonna solve this, we wanna use our entire brain. So what is that, who are the right brain? Where is the right brain in this conversation? If you're sitting around the table as, as left brain developers and, or, or scientists and you only see other left brains, then you're only using half of your capacity. Likewise, if you're trying to solve challenges and you only have artists around the table, you're also using only half of your capacity. We have to have, just like we're talking about intergenerational conversations, we have to have whole-brained conversations. Let's get you know both sides of the brain around the table. Uh, 
I can um I can go next. I also will say this mail was misdelivered here and I've been writing all over it. So sorry, whoever this is, um, looks important from the California Department of Tax and Federal Administration. I think um, investment, so like time, knowing that these things do take a very long time. Um, in the arts, it's something where oftentimes we have deadlines or we need to create work for a show or there's a grant cycle. So figuring out how to put time in and not rush things is very important. Um, not being extractive and amplifying others at the same time. In the arts, there can be a lot of ego. And I think oftentimes we jump into that where it's like, how is this going to elevate myself or elevate my art or project? So um, really making sure that as we climb, we're bringing people along with us because like Galen's dropping all of these amazing people in here, that's exactly what we need to do is amplify that. Um, and research, you know, like you said, Travis, not just using one side of our brain, researching these things. And as I mentioned, EPA jargon, actually knowing what that means. So if you go into a meeting, people aren't just going to assume, oh, you don't know, you're working in the soft sciences, not the hard sciences. I've gotten in countless arguments with engineers specifically, because they will say to me, your background is in the arts and community organizing. You don't understand these values or you don't understand this WASH project. And I can roll up in there and be like, actually, I know this. And I can tell you how to install shark bite fittings and what the best cistern is. So don't come at me acting like I don't know this. By the way, I also know my own community. Um, and the last thing I'll say is knowing when it's okay to say no. Because I also feel like there's a scarcity mentality in the arts where it's like, if I don't say yes to this one opportunity, I'm not going to get anywhere. We hold so much power as artists and community organizers. And I think oftentimes we forget that because there's not a lot of value placed on what we're doing. So being able to say, actually, getting back to the first thing that I said, I need to take this time to invest in another project or research something, not just constantly saying yes. I see this a lot with artists and friends, especially during Native American Heritage Month, when all of a sudden everyone magically gives an F about Native. So it's okay to say no. That's advice that I often have to give myself at 37. These all sound like such good advice. I mean, we need to take time. And I think that we should be prepared for what might be happening, might come, like it, climate change is gonna stress a lot of our institutions. Uh, I don't know if this is really the right answer, but it's what came up to me. It's like, it's gonna stress us, and it's gonna stress our institutions, and we're gonna have to share and make resources go further. Uh, if we don't, it's gonna fracture things. Like we're gonna become more fractured. That, that's, that's the, I think that's the alternative. And so, like, you know, I think of probably all the people here are deeply invested in collaborative work, but I think more than just talking, like we need to come together and do things because that'll feel good. I, I have a friend who's an artist from Belarus and she talks about how like she moved to this country, I think when she was 12 and was like, this, it's weird. Like people don't, don't value just doing things together for the value of doing things together, which I totally, like, I understand, like, I, I kind of get it, but I don't get it because I didn't grow up in a culture that's like about collective action. And that's what she grew up in. And I think that we might have to le relearn some skills and listen to other people. Like, and you know, and this is like true with, in, with like native people too. Like they're always, I have some, you know, like I, I have the privilege of getting to interact with indigenous and native people and they're always telling me uh, interesting things that I didn't know about how the world works because I've just never seen it that way you know um, and I think that that that's like really I just was really valuable anyway I think that our institutions and us as individuals are going to be stressed out by climate change is going to be this rising pressure and if we respond dramatically I don't think that's going <laughs> to work out so one of the things that I think about in climate change is that we need to focus on affordability of the solutions, right? So this gets back to like, we need to pay people. We also need to think about affordable solutions to what's going on. Um, and, or we can just make infinitely more money, but like, 
if we make infinitely more money, we have to redistribute it. And I haven't seen us be willing to do that. I'm also thinking, Galen, about, um, I think a lot of that, cult where I've seen culture shift happen typically happens because artists are involved. So I think part of what you're talking about is gonna require who else can do that kind of culture shift other than artists. Um, so I, my heart started pounding as you started telling me like our, our institutions are gonna fracture, everything's gonna be strained. And then I started thinking, well, the challenges that you're presenting are actually exactly you know, why we think artists should be part of this. So um, I appreciate you all kind of highlighting some entry points for folks, some of the things we should be thinking about in our work moving forward and also why this is so urgent. Um, I'm going to bring in a question from the audience, which is really about education and training opportunities that uh, that offer kind of more of like a cross sector uh, education. So we've talked a bit about how this siloing of sectors is not helpful in climate change work. Um, and that co more collaboration is much more helpful. Um, do you all have any thoughts about how that plays out in our in our training and educational models? Did you all experience any of that when you were <laughs> learning the things that you learned? I mean, it should be included. We should include all of this and in, we should include sustainability and maybe more resilient of resilience thinking and maybe regenerative thinking or like um, systems thinking in everything that we do. Um, it's, it's not what we do, but that that's my opinion. Um, and I don't want to just focus on money because it's not about that, but we should also not expect we shouldn't be comparing arts educations necessarily to software engineers and saying that they're bad because of that, but we shouldn't make them pay the same amount. Just while we're talking about education. Just have a few minutes left if anyone wants to share. Yeah, I was just going to say like a thousand years ago when I went to art school, it was, there were those forms of education or classes but it was very much you know maybe not interior design Travis but it was like the design department and then architecture and it was sort of like oh you other like whatever conceptual artists you're doing who cares and so I do think it would have been a lot more beneficial if I had had access to that and knew that there wasn't just one may one way or five ways of making art but rather that there are those things I always like what MIT is doing because I know they're really building out their arts program. Um, I've worked with them on a couple of things related to climate change and water. I'll drop that in the chat right now. But I do think there are a lot of people or a lot of institutions that might not normally have had it the other way around where they're incorporating art. And it's really cool to see that. And I definitely would like to see it more. My panelists, fellow panelists said it, nothing else to add. Great. All right. Well, I'm really excited uh, for you all to see this issue of Forward that's going to continue to build this from this conversation that we had today. That comes out on Tuesday um, for all the folks who are registered for this panel talk. You will receive the link. You, you should get that in a follow-up email. I want to thank our panelists for participating in this conversation today. I learned so much. I got a ton of great links. We all have our lunch reading um, for, for tomorrow or later today. So thank you all again. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. This is a recorded conversation and you will also get the link to that afterwards. So thanks everyone. Take care. <laughs>